Okay, everybody, welcome to another installment of Beyond the Artist Stand, where it's our little like TED talk of people coming up and giving us a little bit of a presentation of something that they're really well, uh, really good at. So uh, this week we're going to have Lauren uh, give a presentation on storytelling through environments. So uh, I just wanted to welcome Lauren. I put all of Lauren's uh, websites, art stations, and Instagrams in the chat, and they will be up on the YouTube later. But without further ado, Lauren, I will let you take it away and have this amazing presentation. Great. All right. Hello, y'all. Let me just share my screen really quick. Okay. Um, oops, no. I know how to do this. One sec, guys. There we oh no. Off to a great start. Okay. Oop, there we go. All right, cool. So um hello, yes, I am Lauren. I'm a recent CCS graduate with a degree in illustration. I mainly focus on digital illustration and environment art. So I'm gonna talk about two main things today. The first one is obviously storytelling through environments, which can be incorporated into both. 2D and 3D art styles, but then I'm also going to talk about line work and how to make your line work dynamic and interesting, which is more of a 2D illustrative route. Um, so just two topics that I'm really passionate and interested in that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I guess a little bit from more familiar to be more familiar with what I do. I said I'm mainly do environments. I also do comics. So this is a, a story, a children's book illustration I did. Um, some pages of a comic book I worked on this year at school, and then some environments sort of showing the world of that comic. So let's start with storytelling through environments, and let's start with the very basic question of what is an environment? An environment is the world of a story. It's the space that the characters we know and love occupy. Um, it's, you know, it's just as important as any other element of the story. You can't really think about Mario and Luigi without thinking of that fun, colorful world they live in that's filled with, you know, mushrooms and turtles. Um, it's just sort of, you oftentimes associate a fun environment with the character that lives in that world. Um, if you look up online, the very base definition of an environment is an environment can be defined as a sum total of all the living and non-living elements and their effects that influence human life. While all living elements are animals, plants, forests, fisheries, and birds, non-living elements include water, land, sunlight, rocks, and air. So, are stories important to environments? It's a very obvious answer. The answer is yes, they are very important to environments. Oftentimes, environments have just as much history and backstory as a character would. They also are lived in and occupied by anywhere from non-living organism, I mean, sorry, small living organisms like animals to full societies full of people. So obviously they're very dynamic and they're interesting and the oftentimes the world characters lives in tells just as much of a story as the characters themselves. So how to exactly tell a story through an environment? I would say think of it like a character. There are the same principles that apply. So think of the scars or the damage, maybe the usage, uh, the level of wear and tear that an environment has, um, implying how long it's been occupied for. For the clothing, think of small little fun details and decorative elements, like maybe the person that lives in that space is kind of messy. They have a lot of dishes in their sink, or they have a lot of clutter, so they have a lot of things hanging on the walls. Um, think of small elements like that to help give it more personality. The color also can have a big impact if you know that the person that lives in that space is maybe a vampire. They don't like a lot of light. So you obviously aren't gonna give them a bright pastel room. You're gonna give them more of a dark, grimy uh, tone to it. Um, and the background and the personality, that's sort of a big old summary. You want the same aesthetic and the same overall look of your environment to help tie in with the narrative you're trying to portray. Um, it's really important that you give it a life of its own and make it stand out. If you're thinking of how the space is occupied and the characters that are occupied, obviously you want to complement that, but you still want to make the environment strong and able to stand on its own. And you're able to tell about the history and the story of it without really knowing it. Um, that's something that's really important. So if you think about how the space is used, the occupation, if you know, for example, like a witch lives there, you're going to obviously fill it with a bunch of potion bottles um, and spells and books. Um, so just like little things to think of. So now we're going to sort of go into actual examples of storytelling um, and how I've seen them affected with video games. 
Uh, so The Last of Us is a really popular game. It's sort of the game that personally got me into post-apocalyptic artwork. Um, but there's a lot of time skips throughout the game because the game takes place over multiple years, at least the two games do. So it's sort of important to be able to ge um, geographically mark where these time stamps are taking place. Um, one of the biggest parts of the game is Salt Lake City at the very end of the first game. And there's a time skip for a few months. And this environment, it's something we hadn't really seen before. There's in the background, there's signs for a zoo. There's certain mountains and overall architectural um, and architectural elements that we hadn't seen before in the game that implied this was the area that they've been trying to get to this whole time, as well as obviously the road signs are the biggest thing. Um, Pittsburgh is another big city that the game focuses on at the beginning. And if you've ever been to Pittsburgh, you'll know these three big golden bridges are super important. Um, they sort of help you cross the river to get into the city. They're really kind of iconic. And I hadn't even known they were in Pittsburgh, but the second I saw this when I was first seeing it, and I was like, oh my gosh, they're in Pittsburgh. That's so cool. Um, and you don't really need the story to say that the environment speaks, the environment is able to portray that itself. Um, and then in the second game, there's uh, Ellie and Joel sort of settle home in Jacksonville, and it's this little community that all these people have made that is so different from anything else in this world of brutality and sort of death that they've that you've experienced throughout the entire first game. They've there's this entire sequence where you just have um, you play as Ellie walking through this little town that they've made, and there's bars and people dancing, and they set up this little garden, and you even have a snowball fight with these little kids, and it's just so different from anything else, and it accurately portrays kind of how settled in and toned down everything is and it creates a sense of normalcy with these characters that ties in with that environment that you hadn't seen before and it shows just how effective and how different and how much time had passed um without any words spoken it's strictly like just a, like taking in the surroundings and the environment alone which i think is super cool so specific artifacts um throughout the last of us that are prominent uh, in the very first game, there's this level where you're going through sewers and there's this note that you can find. Oftentimes these notes are from just random survivors that are no longer with us, but it adds to that kind of grittiness and brutality of this world. Uh, there's this note talking about he'll be gone, make sure everything's secure, wish me luck. And then as you progress in deeper into the sewers, you find this empty room that's full of dead bodies with they didn't suffer on the ground. And it doesn't take much to take this, see this note and then tie it in with this room and just the overall surroundings to know that something went wrong and that, you know, whoever, whatever people occupied this space are no longer here. And this note that you find deeper into the environment confirms that they got trapped and they had no other way out. So just like simple, effective storytelling that is all through the environment and there's no dialogue that's spoken between any characters. It's all by what you find as the player. So, I like Valor, and everyone knows that, but we're going to talk about it. lore, <laughs> and the behind it is really cool. Um, and I'm going to not get super into it, because I could get super into it, but I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> so, for Valorant, in the world of Valorant, there's this company called Kingdom, and they are responsible for a big energy source in the game called Radionite. And Radionite is stored in these crates. There's around seven maps in the game, and every single map has these crates located in it. And oftentimes these crates are located on the parts of the map where you plant the bomb, uh, because that's the general premise of attacking in this game. And it's been revealed by Riot that the point of planting this bomb is to steal Radionite from the team that's defending. And it would make sense that the only location that these Radionite crates are located in is where you plant the bomb, because they're trying to steal the Radionite from it. It also implies that Kingdom, the company that occupy that controls this radionite has had some sort of presence or impact in almost every single map in the game, which I think is super interesting. Um, it's just a really subtle detail that's it's effective level building because it creates these interactive things for players to kind of hide around and run around and um, play off their abilities. But it also is a level of storytelling, which I think is really interesting. 
So Valorant, whenever they release a character or a map or just really new content in general, they don't just plop it in there. They're like, hi, here's a new level. Here's a new game. Enjoy. They sort of slowly ramp up and build up to it and make the characters sort of make the players go on a hunt to find the information, which I think is really fun. It's a new it's an interactive element that I haven't really seen be done before. So let's talk about that. Uh, the newest character in the game that it was confirmed that they were a blackmailer because throughout the map you would find these cards players would pick them up and it revealed the real names of the agents sort of their fears it's information that we didn't know about them before this was all new information for us but because of this the release of this blackmailer all of this is coming into light um and it's clear that they're not on the best terms with any of the agents that are currently released and then later on after the sort of shortly after this was sort of leaked to players in the training range uh, where you can go and warm up in the game. There was a billboard that was released with different um, pins for the maps of the game, as well as this agent card agent that we had never seen before and the logo that was in a previous battle pass. And then after this, there was this room that used to be boarded up in the training range that was an open showing all these computers. And this laptop here had a voice recording showing a lot of the agents that were blackmailed fighting and actually encountering this blackmailer. And that same audio is then heard in the final release trailer for the new agent, which is Fade. So it's pretty cool. It ties around. It makes you go on sort of a little hunt. You can also see like the billboard there. It just is really fun. It's really cool. It's interactive. It's sort of a way to, for players to explore the environments in, uh, in games I hadn't seen before. Um, it's really cool. Um, and they also do the same with maps. So the newest map was Fracture. And when the game, when Fracture was first released, they talked, they had these little email exchanges between employees to sort of talk about what they did in the facility. It's theorized that the facility was actually utilized by both universes in the game to research Radionite. Um, and also when the map was first released, if you went into like a, if you turned on cheats in a custom mode and floated around, you would find this gun case. And in the initial release of the initial trailer release of Fracture, there was a bullet that was seen shooting the big piece of Radiantite that was floating in here and destroying it, essentially making it Fracture what this map is that we're currently playing on. And people obviously conspir like theorized who would have done this. And then later on, after a few weeks after the map was initially released, they had these boards that could be seen in certain rooms talking about this person if you see them on the premises we don't want them here get them gone um, there also was audio recordings that would play throughout the map with the same information and then shortly after that with the new agent that came out with the release of the map was this guy and he had a gun that matched the one in the box which implies that he was probably the one that destroyed this and created fracture which is super interesting. Um, so those are some kind of fun elements. Obviously, there are many games that have these sort of fun Easter eggs or this fun way of storytelling with their environments. These are just two that I personally am really passionate about and really invested in. So those are the examples I thought to use. But I think it's really cool to sort of, I think it's important to talk about how to incorporate stories into your environments and then actually show how big companies are doing it. So now we're going to move on more about the 2D line art part. Um, so line art is really fun. Um, essentially, it's the edges of your illustration. If you are working within a style of artwork that doesn't require line art, you're working in both hard and soft edges. But when you're working with line art, your line art is essentially your edges. So it's in important to make sure that it doesn't fall flat because it's very easy to get lost in just lining everything. And then you step back and you're like, wow, my piece just looks not dynamic at all. Um, and so this is, these are some tips that I've heard other artists use and I use myself that help make my line art not as flat. So think of it in layers. Think of it like atmosphere perspective. Obviously the stuff that is closest to us is gonna be darkest. And then the stuff that is farthest away from us is gonna be the lightest. So obviously use different line weights. Um, so make or different colors of line weights. So if you're so if you have maybe a forest, the trees that are closest to you are going to be darkest and have the thickest line art, and the trees farthest back are going to be thinner and have maybe like a light gray line art. Um, it obviously it does 
it depends on the piece and what you're going for, but try and think of it in layers. Also consider your light source. Um, if you know, for example, your light is coming from the left, maybe make your liner um, darkest and most condensed on the right or vice versa. That is another way you can add dimension. Um, fit it with the mood of your piece. Um, and also favor it towards how you plan to color render it. These kind of go hand in hand. If you know, for example, you're doing maybe like a steampunk nitty gritty art piece, maybe use a line art brush that has some texture, some grit to it to help tie in with that mood you're trying to convey. Um, and also make it complement your work and not overdo it. It's sort of, it, I say this to myself a lot too, because I tend to go overboard. If you can, if you step back and you look at your piece and you're losing all of that detail, you just, you know, put all the time into you, you know, it's probably time to stop. Just know when it's important to step away and start rendering and or let the line art speak for itself. So the five step process, I want to make things clear. I don't want to tell you this is the right way to do line work because this is how I do it, because that would be silly. This is simply the process and the five steps that I personally found to be most successful. Um, you're more than welcome to try them, incorporate what you would like through the process or try something new. You can take it how you will, but this is just personally how I do line art. Um, so the first step is baseline work. This is when you're getting all the main shapes and making sure that your image reads well. Your thickening and item separation is when you start to thicken some lines. This is the part where you start to consider your light source. Um, to add a little bit of dimension. Your sub details would be adding in the little things that aren't necessarily a main form, but help the image read better. So like all these little um, leaves that I added, um, the cracks in the glass, things like that. Atmospheric separation is when you actually separate those layers I was talking about earlier. So the leaves in the foreground, you know, this test tube, all of this in the back, that's all separated by different line weight. And that's important. It that that I would say is the most important making your layers visible is that step. And then your final details. Those are going to be very subtle things that will be on top of everything else um, layer wise. So, for example, if you know that your sword is going to be on fire, you're probably going to want the line art for the fire on top of everything else. So it reads the most clear. So now, now that I've talked about that, I think it's easier for you to physically see it. <laughs> um, so this is my little frog that you probably saw me make. So this is actually step by step how I did the line art for him. Uh, I think for an environment, it would look fairly similar, just a lot more complex. <laughs> um, so this is the baseline. I get the base shape of my little froggy. I don't really have a whole lot of detail with him. Step two, you see how I'm starting to polish out the light source. I know that I want the light to be coming from this direction. So I added all the thicker lines on this side. I also helped separate certain items like the hat from his head. I knew I wanted his eye to be prominent and his wand. Sub details. These are things, like I said, that don't necessarily help the image read better, but it does add dimension to it. Um, so like the little pattern on his hat and his little froggy bumps and the the lines that will um, separate his coloring. And then atmospheric separation, like I said, if you're doing an environment, that would be the layers. But because this is such a simple illustration, I just added an outline around him because I knew I'd be wanting to turn him into like a sticker or something. And then final details. You add, I did the little magic. Um, I went ahead, oops. I did the little magic swirly around him because that's something that's going to definitely be on top of everything because I want it to stand out. And obviously it wouldn't make sense if it was underneath the other layers of line work. And now we're going to go over a demo of how I made this little guy. Um, I'm not going to go over how I rendered him. I will be more than happy to do that, but not with this presentation. So <laughs> anyway, let's let me get my iPad because I'm going to be sharing through that. Give me a quick sec here. <clears throat> and I guess, I don't know if we'd want to ask, like, do questions while I draw, um, if anyone would want. OK. So hopefully you all can see my screen, see my little froggy here. Um, so I can talk a little bit about layering and stuff too, um, and I guess sort of the different brushes I use. I tend to use a lot of the standard Procreate brushes. I don't think I use any imported ones for my line work. 
if I'm doing comic or more clean work, I'll use this clear up brush, but just with different line or not. I'm sorry, that is the studio pen. Where's the this one? This one I I use this one because the the different weight you can get with it. Lauren, um, can you full screen the share thing? Uh, Kenny, no, he won't let me full screen. Okay, oh, that's wait. Fine. I'm sorry. No, it's all good. It doesn't matter. Okay. If he can't, then that's okay. Yeah, it was a long no, time to do it earlier. Okay. It um, is all good. Don't be distracted. Don't be distracted <laughs> by my stuff here. Does it help? No, you? it's totally it's okay. Totally okay. <laughs> all righty. <laughs> so, um, so I guess I yes I use the syrup for uh more polished work, and then typically for environments or for like this, I'll use the Narrator pencil. Um, it has sort of like a texture, like a subtle texture to it, which I like. And I just like made it different sizes so I can make it bigger. Um, so for that, we're going to use this. We're going to use this. Um, so let's just get started. I'm, I don't really have a set space. I typically start with eyes with animals just because they're fun. Um, sort of go through lines. I tend to, whenever I erase, I always will use the same brush so I get the same texture because if you use like harsher brush, I don't know, it just is weird to me. <laughs> So um, if I'm using like the Narrator pencil to draw, I'll use it to erase. And I tend to taper off my edges just because it adds a little bit. It doesn't take too long, and I like the look of it. Um, and I don't know. I guess feel free to ask questions. I don't. Uh, I guess I'll talk about like some of my thought process when I work. But a lot of it is just uh, getting the main forms down, and then knowing what to add and when to add it. Um, yeah, so if anybody out. has any questions, just unmute and ask. Yeah, I don't bite, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah, I like... No, I guess, Lauren, do, do you have any advice when trying to craft some of your storytelling? Do you, do you say anything to yourself when you're starting to do something like that, when you're doing some pre-production on some kind of environment that you're creating? Oh, yeah. Um, I definitely i think the biggest thing is i think about who's occupying the space and how they occupy it um i also think about the history of it how the space used to be used so with my comic a lot of it is post-apocalyptic abandoned uh places and two of the biggest um locations are abandoned an abandoned hospital and an abandoned medical center so I think of sort of before these places were abandoned and utilized by the villains of my comic, um, what kind of happened, uh, if that makes sense. Um, sorry, I need to stop talking. Um, no, that makes sense. Yeah. So. I guess another thing I can add to your question is like, what's its purpose? So if I know that it's um, going to be used by the villains or the heroes, that is something I take into consideration. I also take into consideration what will happen to it later on in the storyline. So if I know that it'll eventually become abandoned again, or if it's going to be like a spot, like a part of a war zone, or if one of the monsters that's in my world is going to start inhabiting it, that's something I take into consideration. Um, I oftentimes, I guess in my previous work I showed, I talked, I depicted how one of the big labs looked like before and after it was abandoned, because I think it's cool to see how these spaces were actually utilized before you see them in my comic. It kind of adds a background um, or some context to those spaces. Uh, besides Last of Us and Valorant, do you have any other examples of really good storytelling through environmental imagery oh yeah um i definitely would say detroit become humans a really cool one especially given that we're in detroit um if you've ever been to if you've ever played through that game like the landmarks and sort of the effective choices that you can do are really cool um 
it also is pretty accurately represents Detroit, which is also cool. Um, another one is Until Dawn's pretty good. That one is similar to The Last of Us. It has a lot of like subtle artifacts that you can find. It also allows the environment to sort of dictate some of the choices you make. Uh, the situations that characters are put in through based on the intense environments uh, make you force you to make quick choices uh, that can sometimes negatively impact what characters live or die. Um, if for those that don't know, the, the, Until Dawn's like a butterfly effect video game. So the choices you make impact other characters live or die, uh, which is pretty fun. <laughs> uh, but that's also something uh, they also make like nature play a big. Uh, that is a terrible line. We're going to redo that. Um, they also have nature play a big role with different animals and how they interact with the environments. And if you kill the animals, you'll negatively be your choices will negatively be uh, impacted, which is pretty interesting. Those are some I can think off the top of my head. <laughs> also outlast outlast is another pretty good one i would say uh it's a horror game and the way that they create intensity and sort of brutality with the environments is really impressive because uh the character you play in that game is not a fighter you're literally only allowed to hide or run from all the villains and terrible monsters that are present in this world so it's really intense it's really brutal but it's very fun to watch people play. <laughs> and um, they it, there's a lot of storytelling that's present. You can tell that a lot of terrible stuff happened in, within this insane laboratory that you're being forced to study without physically knowing all the contents. And similar to the other games I mentioned, there's a lot of documents that you can find that talk about the horrors that the people operating these facilities endured before you arrived. I is the most of my froggies done. I guess sometimes uh, for line art, if you know you're going to be doing, for example, if you know that you want the color of the brim of your hat, of his hat, to be a different color when you color the line work, it might be easier just to keep it all on a separate layer rather than making it all one layer. But I'm lazy, so I'm going to make it all one layer. But you don't have to do that. <laughs> um, just sort of depends. Uh, like for environments, if I know that I'm doing more complicated coloring with my line art later, I will definitely separate it. But for this demo, we're just going to keep it all one layer. So Lauren, what do you think are some common pitfalls people are trying to start to create storytelling through environments kind of like run into when they first started to get into this? Yeah, so I think like subtlety is a big thing. If you like shove it down a viewer's throat, I think it just oversaturates it and it makes it not as impressive. I think it's important to subtly release certain key elements of an environment's story. Um, I also think the style plays a big role. If you... I'm trying to think of how to word this. I have it in my head. Um, I think if you're, for example, going for a more brutal or horror, horror impact, going strictly for shock value is not necessarily a way to go. I think it's important to give everything purpose uh, when instructing your environments and your storytelling um, and not overdoing it. Like I said, I think similar to knowing when to add enough details, like no one enough is enough. These aren't the best stars, forgive me, but they get the job done. <laughs> They kind of look like the little flowers from SpongeBob's sky, the sky from SpongeBob. That's okay though. So 
So I guess this is a little bit off topic, but Lauren, but mm -hmm. why do you use Procreate over Photoshop? Yeah, the, it's budget friendly. <laughs> um, so Procreate, if you don't know, is a one-time payment of $10 and then you get it, you get the whole thing. It's very easy to use. Um, and all of these fun brushes that I've downloaded for texture, I have gotten free from friends or from concept artists or other designers that have offered them for free online, which is wonderful. Um, another thing is I just, I chose to either invest in a drawing tablet or a Wacom or an iPad sophomore year of college. And I chose the iPad because I wanted the portability of it. And I think out of every Apple product out there, I would highly recommend the, the iPad. Sorry, I had a brain fart. <laughs> um, yes, so that's my answer to that. I would highly recommend uh, Procreate if you haven't tried it. It's very easy. It's very beginner friendly. It was the first program I used how to digitally illustrate. So I have the base down for our little froggy. So now we're going to start adding some dimension. We're going to give him some fun, fun line thickness. So I'm just going to kind of play around until I find. See, that's good. OK, so like I said, I wanted I was going to have the light source come from this side. So we're going to obviously make it darker on this side, uh, the line work. And I, t I have a new layer. So I don't mess up all the artwork I just did, all the work I just did. So let's get started. So this is also like a part where you can taper off lines to make them have a little bit more of an interesting shape to them. And a lot of this is like just playing around and seeing what you like. Uh, so for example, I might taper off this line and I'm like, wow, I don't like that. Uh, and that's okay. A lot of it is like a learning process. It also really depends on what you're illustrating. Uh, it could be different for a character or an environment or prop, whatever it is you're doing. Oh, and I didn't, I don't think I did this with the other one, but let's add some little dimension to the stars. Wow. Get it a little interesting in here. Kind of helps add some more dimension to the hat, maybe. Let's see, like that already, look at that. That already adds, that's fun. All right. See, Lauren from two days ago wouldn't have even thought about adding that, but Lauren of now says yes. Okay, I'm going to thicken this up like a little bit, not like a whole lot, just enough to sort of separate it from the background. And then eyes are always a big thing. I love like having the thicker lines at the top, sort of where it will, will be darker. I don't know. I just think that adds a lot to them without much work. And with like the upper line, like give him some eyeliner, essentially. There we go. Because this is the under chin, it'll kind of be shadowed. I'll thicken that up a little. Not like a whole lot, but.
This is why it's important to have it on different layers so you can get those nice curves and then erase this and not have to worry about messing up your the work you already did. And I would say like this step is probably at least in my opinion the most satisfying because when it this is like when it's starting to come together and in my opinion I know that it's only like the second step of the two but it's when you actually start to see the different items that you've created sort of stand out from one another and then it's only reinforced when you add color which I think is pretty cool might as well add a little to that Wait, so see, wow, he's starting to come together. Wait, I already found something I wanted to fix. There we go. All right, so now he's starting to come together. So we're going to add the little details. Um, so let's see, look at the difference. Wow. So let's add the little details. So I have my reference here. Go back to my little brush. That's a little too small. Let's just make this little... That's fine. Okay. So, uh, I know that frogs, you notice that they have this, like, this shape. There's, like, a ring around that, but I did the stylistic choice of not doing that. Um, but I still like the idea of having that ring. So, I'm going to add another uh, line in there. And I'll do that on this side, too. And so I think this was the part where I noticed that maybe like this line doesn't match up with how I want it to for the line of his coloring. Because if you see how his coloring sort of like dips, his like thing kind of dips into a little Cupid's bow. Is that what it's called? I think so. Sorry if I'm wrong. But... So... Let's make him a little different than the one I saw. So let's actually do that. Wow. And then... So personally, it's a stylistic choice. I don't have all my lines uh, line up like this. Uh, you're obviously... Some people will choose to like have it connect. I think it's kind of fun when it doesn't because you can have your rendering and your color fill that in and it's just as effective. And let's look at my reference again. Okay, so he has a little... Kind of lines up with the top of his leg tail. Here we go. And then let's, of course, get his legs they have little underbellies which are so cute and of course like when you actually go to render this out or if you choose to render it you're always like don't be restricted to what you've already done with your line art you're more than welcome to like take away parts of it that you don't think are necessary anymore or add more to it you also if you're like Hey, I want to, I don't know, maybe like smudge. Yes, I had to get the right layer. If I want to maybe like smudge this into the shading and then make it a different color, like don't be afraid to try that because you never will know. You might like find something cool that's unique to your style that you like. All right, so the last thing for these little details, I think we're going to add the little, the classic, look all those little bumps on the back of him. We're going to add those. And these are fun because you just literally go ham and you don't think of, you don't be specific with it. So that's not the best line. And then tapering it off. This is like a really quick though. I would spend like more time on this, but for the sake of the demo, I'm going kind of fast. Okay, so details. Look at that. Wow, he's starting to come together. Um, 
So atmospheric first ap ap atmospheric. So we're gonna give them a big old border. And I typically, at least for stickers for like this kind of art, I'll typically put the border underneath all my other layers. Um, so yeah, nice big old border. But still, when you do this, keep in mind about the step, which is the um, separating your items and giving it dimension, because you don't want to take away that sense of light source that you did with the uh, the previous. You don't want to take. You don't want to get rid of all that hard work that you did. So. I guess like for this, uh, I worked on, I went on the outside of the thick, the thicker lines. Then for the thinner lines, I'm going to go right over top of the lines. And it kind of, it gives it some difference. And it's not like a lot. Obviously, I would probably spend more time polishing it, but gets the point across. Wow, look at him. He looks so cute. So now he's definitely separated from the background. He helps stands out, but we still kept our thicker lines on this side and our thinner lines on this side to help kind of establish our light source. And we did that all with this liner, which is pretty cool. So now the last thing is we're going to add the little cute swirlies to him to make his wand so he's magical. Um, and for this, I so for this, this is a trick I do. I'll typically group these items. I'll duplicate the group. I'll hide the bottom group and I'll flatten the top group so I can make it a little less opaque. And then it makes it easy to easier to see what I'm doing. Um, I don't know. That's I don't know if that's an effective trick, but that's a trick I do. <laughs> um, so we're just going to kind of give them. I don't know. We're not going to be too. Because a lot of this is going to be, like, blurred. Uh, so we're not going to be, like, too picky with it. And then I know I want it going behind the hat on the top. So let's do that. Wow. And then add some fun dots. Just because. I actually I don't like this line. This is this looks like a weird line, so I'm gonna redo it. I also don't like that line. Okay, there we go. And then of course tapering it. Wow. Obviously if you have a brush that like easily is like pressure sensitive and tapers off, that that will probably save you time, but I don't have that. <laughs> Um, I am not the best at figuring out how to make brushes. <laughs> um, I sort of just use what is provided for me. Uh, so 
I probably am doing a little bit more work for myself, but that's okay. Alrighty. Oops. Joke at that with a little racer there. All right, and there you go. Wow. And make sure you organize and name your layers. I'm really bad at doing that, but there you go. There's the wizard frog. And then obviously you can add color to him and make him look fun. Um, but yes, and I guess I can go through. So I see when I did the line work, this is like a whole, oh my God, my file's a mess. But you can see how I like did, I blurred parts of the line work um i sh diff i blended parts of the line work in uh like right here oops like right here okay will it let me draw oh there it goes okay that was weird so like if you can see i blended like the line work like the lines i did up here i blended those in um i went over with like rendering on these lines right here um to sort of tie in with the rendering more uh, so just like things like that, just, a lot of it's experimenting to try and find something that's successful, but I don't know, hopefully you learned something. That's, <laughs> I don't know if anyone has any other questions, but that's sort of what I had planned. I know it's almost eight, but yeah. Yeah.